Hello everybody, my name is Kara, and today I'm here with my July wrap-up. So first off, I participated in Tome Topple, and the first book I finished for that was Flora's Dare by Isabeau S. Wills. This is the second book in a trilogy, and it takes place in kind of the region of California, but sort of an alternate history version. It is very heavily inspired by Aztec mythology. Basically, in the second book, our main character, Flora Segunda, is trying to save the city from a monster underground. I still really enjoy the writing and, like, the kind of quirky and interesting setting. I've never really read anything like this kind of setting before, and I also really like Flora herself. Unfortunately, I didn't enjoy this book quite as much as the first one. I took too long of a break, I think, in between the books, because sometimes what happens when I do that is, without even realizing it, I start forming predictions about what the plot of the next book is going to be about. So then when I get to the next book, if those things don't actually happen, I'm disappointed, even though it's my own fault. And that is kind of what happened with this one. There were some other issues, though, that I think are separate from that. I really, really didn't like Flora's, like, best friend kind of quasi-love interest. He was just really, really irritating. He did a lot of stupid things. There were a couple of side characters in this book that I really enjoyed, even if I didn't quite agree with how they were handled. It sort of felt like Flora formed this opinion about a certain character, and we were just supposed to go along with her, when it's like, okay, but the evidence you're showing the reader kind of makes me feel differently. I still highly recommend the first book, which I think is just called Flora Segunda. I think that one is really fantastic, and I even think this one would be really good if you didn't go into it with the same preconceptions that I did, and I ended up giving it three stars. Next for Tom Topple, I finished The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, and this is the translation by Jacques Leclerc. I did this as a buddy read with Trisha from Tell Her a Story. This is about a group of three musketeers, but actually more like four. There's a lot of spies and like intrigue and international politics, and it's basically a swashbuckling kind of adventure novel. I really enjoyed the writing of this book, you know, writing and I guess translation of this novel. I think it was handled really well, and it was was such a quick and engaging style, and I also found that a lot of the characters really grew on me. D'Artagnan, the main character in particular, I just feel like he was so... he was really frustrating at the beginning, but I find that I really, as he developed, I really got to like him and appreciate him. However, I did have a few kind of big problems with this one. There was this one really long section near the end that was following a character who I just had had enough of. Like, I didn't really care about what happened to them anymore. And also the treatment of female characters really, really graded on me by the end of this book. I kind of went into it expecting a certain amount of that because it's a classic novel, it was sort of written as like a guy fantasy just about guys. I knew going in this is probably not gonna have like fantastically developed female characters. The treatment and the perspective on women in this book was just so unhealthy and so frustrating, and not, not just the way that the characters were treated, but like the way that all of them thought and spoke about women. It just got to a point where I, I don't know, I couldn't look past it anymore. And I also just hated the ending of this book. I, I did not find it satisfying. There was this one thing that happened that I was like, oh, finally, we've been waiting for this for ages. But the way it was handled was so frustrating. I ended up giving this one three stars as well. Next, I co-hosted Retelethon, and the first book I finished for that was Circe by Madeline Miller. So this is kind of a retelling of the character of Circe from the Odyssey or from Greek mythology. This is definitely a very character-driven novel. You're pretty much following Circe from her childhood, if you could call it that, because she's a goddess, but you follow her through all these like major kind of life events and through her exile to her island, and of course we touch on the famous events, you know, like Odysseus like stopping at her island. The character of Circe herself was just so wonderful and so engaging, and I could really just connect to her, and I was so invested in what happened to her, so that even when there wasn't a lot of action, like there wasn't a lot of plot, I was never bored because I loved Cersei so much and I just, I wanted her to be happy. I wanted to see how she continued to develop because she undergoes some fantastic character development in this book as well. And I also adored Madeline Miller's writing style. It flowed so well, it was descriptive without being overbearing, and just, she has such an immense talent for crafting like scenery and characters with just a few well-chosen words. This story worked so beautifully with the myth and with the other depictions of Circe, because there are events that are told from Circe's perspective that absolutely would have fit in with the Odyssey if we had just followed another character rather than Odysseus. Like it wasn't like uh, it wasn't like Madeline Miller was ignoring the, like, Greek mythological canon. There were scenes that were explained from Circe's eyes that I was like, I never thought to wonder about why this happened in the original story, but this makes sense. I do want to mention that there is a trigger warning for rape in this book. This was just such a fantastic novel. I can't think of anything I would change about it, actually. And there's this one, there's this one point in the book where I was thinking I might end up docking a little, like a half a star or something, but Madeline Miller won me over after that event happened and the way that 
Cersei was was handling it and just the way the story unfolded after that I like totally got like the way she used it and where she was coming from. So I gave Cersei 5 out of 5 stars. Then I finished the group book which was The Surface Breaks by Louise O'Neill. This is kind of a dark little mermaid retelling. I'll get the positives out of the way first. I absolutely adored the sea witch Sito. I think that's how you say her name. I would read a whole book about her. <laughs> All of the scenes with her in them were my favorites in the whole book. Alas, everything else about this book I thought was very badly done. So first off, the characters themselves were so incredibly flat and underdeveloped. Gaia, the protagonist, she was so flat. Her sisters felt like they had very little personality. And the plot was also just so repetitive and boring. Like, I don't... I don't understand what the point of this book was because there's this element about mystery and about Gaia trying to figure out what happened to her mother and they just like beat you over the head with that over and over like Gaia keeps she keeps going through the same thought processes without ever making any progress and I'm like I understand that you're invested in finding your mother like I'm not blaming you for thinking about it but do something or like draw a new conclusion because over and over we just got like the same sequence of thoughts from Gaia and the rest of the plot was equally repetitive because she goes up to the surface and and she knows that she has to try and get the prince's I don't even remember his name he was so forgettable I can't remember his name I honestly can't anyway the prince she goes up to like try and get him to fall in love with her so she can live on land and blah 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 and he's he's not like immediately interested in her so uh, she's like, okay, that's fine. So like the next day she decides to try again and like the exact same thing happens. He's not interested. She is like the prince's mother is like really like rude to her. And there's like these secrets about the prince and like his father's past and all of this and all of that keeps happening. There's like no differentiation between the days that Gaia is on land. Another problem I had was the absolute vagueness of the human world like setting. Was he actually a prince? Like what was his mom just a CEO? Was she a CEO and also like a duchess? And also Gaia, the whole like silent um, silent character thing I think was handled really badly because you can have a character who can't speak and still have them feel fully developed and able to communicate and like connecting with people. Gaia did not. She didn't really like gesture or try to make herself understood. Like it was like by not having by not having a voice she had no personality and that's not true of people and that's not true of characters and then another huge huge problem I had with her so there is also a trigger warning for sexual assault in this book and one of the big problems I had was the way that Gaia responds to one of the events of, of like one of the examples of this at one point we see we're seeing through Gaia's eyes it's first person and she sees one of the like one of the absolute worst characters in the book he's a disgusting human being and everyone knows this and she sees him lead off a girl with the almost like explicit intention to rape her. Gaia knows this is going to happen. We know from her internal monologue there is no doubt in her mind what's about to occur and she does nothing and like there was there was not even an, an attempt to make that understandable. If there had been some indication that she had a reason for her inaction however small like maybe she was really traumatized by something that had happened to her and she was afraid that if she tried to stop it like she would be herself raped and she wouldn't be able to help the girl like if there was anything like that any indication that she had some kind of reason for not doing it i don't want to say it wouldn't have been as bad but it would have been slightly more understandable but there was nothing it was like gaia knew what was going to happen she recognized this to herself and was just like mm what are you gonna do? And just watched him drag this girl off. And after that I was just, I was not on board for Gaia at all. One of the selling points of this book was that it was a feminist twist on The Little Mermaid. I do not think that was true at all. You can't just show women being treated awfully and call that feminism. Like that does not make your book feminist if you just show bad things happening to girls. Like you actually have to use it for some purpose or like challenge it. And I feel like the only way the author sort of tried to do that was at the very very end with the ending scene that kind of came out of nowhere and made no sense like all of a sudden it's like girl power feminism women taking control and I'm like where did this come from like there was no there's no shift in the characters perspectives going back to Gaia's really repetitive internal narration over and over she would be like but that is not what girls are supposed to do and like rather than providing really interesting social commentary it just got frustrating because it was the same thing over and over and you can't just like you can't just 
duplicate a problem and call that social commentary, in my opinion. And it was so upsetting because Louise O'Neill wrote another book called Asking For It, which I read a few months ago, and it was absolutely brilliant. It was such a well-crafted and intense takedown of rape culture. I gave The Surface Breaks 1.5 stars. The next book I finished for Retelethon was Spinning Silver by R.C. Lewis. I think Wild Swans is the original name of the story. So this is a science fiction retelling and our main character is Liddy and she has seven brothers and one day they are all kidnapped and Liddy is implanted with a device in her throat that means she has to be silent. If she makes any sound, her brothers will be killed. So she kind of gets set on this mission to try and rescue them and along the way she sort of gets tangled up in this bigger problem that is facing their planet and kind of their whole solar system of planets related to portals and traveling to different worlds. I really enjoyed most of the characters and their interactions. There is kind of a love interest angle that I didn't find too overpowering for the story so that was nice. His name was Tiav and I did like him. He was a very... he was just like a very like, good person and really smart and funny, and I really enjoyed seeing him and Liddy interact. And another thing that I think was one of the book's strengths was Liddy's mutism. So she can't speak because of this device in her throat, and reading from her perspective, I think you really connected to her frustration, like, seeing her struggle to communicate, especially when she's got this incredibly stressful situation hanging over her head. Her brothers are in danger of, for, of losing their lives and she can't even communicate that to someone. I think that was done so well because I really felt for her. I really felt that frustration of not being able to speak and not being able to do anything to save the people you love. That was an example of a silent character done very well because she does still she does still communicate. She's gesturing, you know, she's making faces. I also liked the world and like the scientific or science fiction elements. I thought those added a lot to the story and I enjoyed seeing kind of the different planets and the different characters perspectives on the sci-fi elements. Sometimes it was a very technical thing, sometimes it was very like full of wonder and kind of spiritual and things like that, so it was really cool seeing that difference among the different characters and among the different races. So I ended up giving this book 3.75 stars. It's almost a four stars but not quite, and really the only reason is that the book was kind of forgettable in the end. Like, I only read it a couple weeks ago and I'm already struggling to remember, and I also didn't like some aspects of the ending. But overall, I do think this was a really good story. I do recommend it if you're looking for a science fiction kind of fairy tale retelling. And the last book I read for Retelathon, I actually... I finished after the readathon ended, and that is Beauty by Robin McKinley. This is, of course, a retelling of Beauty and the Beast, and this sticks pretty closely to the original story and kind of the initial setup because Beauty's father is a very wealthy merchant and he loses everything. So her and her two sisters and her father move to this kind of village. I really enjoyed the characters, including the Beast's character, which is so important with <laughs> with Beauty and the Beast retellings. It's very easy for the Beast to come off as, as irredeemable or inhuman, and kind of the whole point of the story is that he is still a human underneath the spell. One of the only things I didn't love about this book was the tendency that the main character had to sort of like harp on the theme of beauty, because beauty in this case is an ironic nickname. She is kind of the like least attractive of her sisters, but when she was young she was very beautiful, so everyone called her beauty, and then she grew up kind of plain, and no one has the heart to stop calling her that. At least that's what the main character thinks. But off and on throughout the book she would compare herself to her sisters, or she would talk about how this didn't make sense that she was in this magical castle because she was so plain and things like that. And I think I could excuse it a little bit because it is an important central theme, you know, is like beauty and whether or not someone's outward appearance reflects who they are and things like that. But overall, I pretty much loved everything else about this book. I know some people think the, uh, the ending is too abrupt, but I actually didn't mind it. There are some retellings I love because they are so different from the original, and there are some that I love because they really capture the spirit of the original. And this one I think is definitely the second one, and I gave Beauty 4 out of 5 stars. The next book I finished was The Real Boy by Anne Ursu. This was a recommendation from Bookrat Misty. We follow our main character, Oscar, and he lives on this kind of magical island where magic is sort of declining, but it's still a commodity, it's still a product, and he's sort of the underling of this really talented magician. Kind of, he's less than the apprentice. He basically does all of the, like, nitty-gritty work, and he's really good at it. And he's this young boy who has always felt out of place, kind of, like he doesn't see the world the same other people do. He has a very d difficult time interacting with people. And now Oscar and another character, Cassie, have to figure out what is going wrong with this magic, why their island is having these bad things happen, why children are falling sick. I loved Anne Ursu's writing. It's got just the right balance of whimsy and beautiful style and humor and just really, really simple when it needs to be. And Another thing I love about this book, which you guys may have heard me mention before, is that it's got that very 
ordinary kind of hero. Like, Oscar is not the chosen one. He's just an ordinary boy who decides that he has to try and do something because nobody else is going to. He's written very similarly to characters that are on the autism spectrum. I do not have personal experience with this, so I wouldn't want to overstep, but from what I've read, the way that Oscar sees the world and the way that he interacts with people seems to be very much in line with a child who has autism. And I think that the way Anne Ursu helps us see through his perspective and, like, really understand and connect with his worldview was so important. Everything about this book was just beautifully told, beautifully executed, and I gave The Real Boy 5 out of 5 stars. Next, I finished Shut Out by Cody Keplinger. This is a modernization of the story Lysistrata. It's a Greek comedy by Aristophanes. And in this novel, our main character, what's her name? Lyssa, decides that she is tired of the ridiculous rivalry between the football team and the soccer team at her high school. So she gets together with all the girlfriends of the football players and some of the girlfriends from the soccer player team. So they decide that until this silly feud is over, there will be no kissing, no hooking up, no nothing between these girls and their boyfriends. But then of course Alyssa starts having some chemistry with one of the boys from the soccer team. So this was a really disappointing book for me. I really, really love the play Lysistrata. I highly recommend that. There's a lot of issues with it. You know, it's not quite the pinnacle of feminist thought that some people sometimes make it out to be, but I think it's a really enjoyable play and it's worth reading. This book, I do not think was a good version of that story. I felt that all of the characters were really flat and surface level. I thought that the romantic, like the romance between Lyssa and the soccer player guy, again, I forgot his name. This was a very forgettable book. I could not tell you this guy's name. Oh yeah, it was Cash Sterling. I couldn't feel any of the chemistry between Lissa and Cash. I just didn't understand why they liked each other. I didn't understand what drew them to the other person besides like, oh, okay, Cash is hot and he treated you like an actual person. There was also this weird like element kind of thrown in. One of the characters smokes and like one of the teenage characters and it's treated as like an extension of her cool girl personality and I don't know. I just, I feel like, when was this book published? 2011. So not that long ago. Like, we know better now. I just think we're past the point of glorifying cigarettes. And then there was another issue I had with Lissa herself. For one thing, I just didn't find her very interesting as a protagonist. But uh, something else that really bothered me was they throw around kind of the, like, OCD and, like, things like that. And it's not really clear if if that's, like, an overuse that we are meant to criticize or if we're supposed to believe that Lissa actually has OCD, because eventually we find out some habits she has and some things she does that would seem to support that, but then there's other things she does where it, like, doesn't really make sense with that, and it's so hard to, like, talk about representation and things like that in a book, because obviously not everyone's experience is going to be the same, but to me it didn't ring true, and the book as a whole seems to really make light of this situation. I don't know, maybe I'm reading way too much into it, but I feel like if you're gonna throw around words like that, you should kind of be careful about how you use them or about how your characters reflect them. Really the only thing I actually liked about this book was the the female friendships and seeing how they like form different opinions about each other and how first impressions aren't always true. And another thing about this book that is just so weird is like I'm not even sure if this could be considered a feminist book because it's sort of like the surface breaks. Everything was so like sledgehammer obvious. Like she would think to herself when she's talking to another girl like isn't it funny that men are allowed to sleep around and do all of this, but if a girl just has sex with one guy, like, she's a slut. And it's like, that's true, but the way you said it made it sound so almost unimportant or obvious or something. Like, there's just no subtlety to any of this. And again, that goes back to what I was saying earlier, where, like, you have to actually do some social commentary for it to count. One other thing that I thought was well done was the discussion of sexuality, like, female sexuality in particular, and, like, the equal support that should be given to women is like the freedom to choose who you sleep with extends to choosing not to sleep with anybody. Like I do think there was some good discussion about that. But I just wish that the other feminist issues in the book had been handled equally well. Unfortunately they weren't and I gave shut out two stars. Next I finished Knitting for Tommy, Keeping the Great War Soldier Warm by Lucinda Gosling. And this year is the World War One centenary. It, this November 11th will mark the 100th anniversary of the armistice that ended World War One. This is a very short non-fiction book. As some of you might know, I am a knitter. I really enjoy that so I was really interested to read this. I think it was a really good balance of fun anecdotes and really informative discussion and like the historical context and how women were able to help the war effort by sending like care packages and knitting. It was also written in a very engaging and easy and quick to read style, so I really liked that. The only thing that I was 
disappointed in is the actual patterns they give you in the back that are the ones they used. They're really hard to read. Like, they basically just copy-pasted the old articles that had these patterns in them, and I think that if you're gonna buy a book on uh, knitting for, like, knitting for the First World War that includes patterns, I think it would be reasonable that they would make them easier to read. Like, that's part of what you're paying for. But everything else about this book I really enjoyed, and I gave it four out of five stars. Next, I finished The House of the Four Winds by Mercedes Lackey and James Mallory. This is about a princess named Clarice who dresses up as a boy, and she goes on a ship, and she was training to be a, sh a sword master. And all these other things that the blurb spoils for you happen, and they end up having to try and defeat a sorceress, kind of. The villain, or the antagonist, was just annoying. I feel like the whole plot was just so slow moving, and part of the plot issues are due to the summary. As I mentioned, they give away so much of what happens. So like two-thirds into the book, there's an event that occurs that the back of the book made it sound like was gonna happen near the beginning, so I think that didn't help either. The romance was just not not great. Um, I didn't understand why the two characters liked each other, and I gave The House of Four Winds two stars. And finally, the last book I finished in July was Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet by Jamie Ford. We follow two timelines, one during World War II with our main character Henry, who is Chinese-American, and he makes friends with this Japanese-American girl, and she is interned in one of the camps, and then the flash-forward timeline is sort of him possibly trying to reconnect with her and also reconnect with his son. So the thing I did really like about this book was the historical elements and historical context. Because I think it was so interesting and important to see the perspective of the Chinese people or of the Chinese American people and how they were reacting or how some of them reacted to the Japanese internment. There were some people like Henry's father who were very much in favor of it because the Japanese had invaded China, their homeland, so they kind of, they felt this very nationalistic pride in seeing the Japanese Americans interned, even though they weren't the same ones who had invaded China. And then there were some people who were very much on the Japanese American side and who, like, they were holding their personal belongings while they were taken away to the camps. So it was really interesting seeing kind of the difference in perspective and how people viewed this horrible period in America's history. Unfortunately, everything besides the historical elements I thought was handled so badly. The writing of this book was awful. It was so cliche, so frustrating, and I thought that the characters were so, so flat and underdeveloped. I could not tell you a single personality trait about any of them, and I do mean any of them. Not Henry, not Kiko, the Japanese-American girl who Henry falls in love with, like, not his father. I don't even know what Henry looks like. Like, there is just, there's no, no weight given to connecting to these characters. Even though, like, the historical elements were interesting, I don't think that was enough to carry the book. And I don't mean the parts that were semi-based on Jamie Ford's father's experience, but I just mean everything else about the story. Like, 12-year-olds declaring their love for each other. It just doesn't do it for me. <laughs> I don't know. I just found it weird and, like, unbelievable. Like, if it had been a really strong, deep friendship, I would have been totally on board. If it had been even a friendship that you were kind of hinted might develop into romance when they were older, I would have totally been on board for that, too. But to have these, like, 11 or 12-year-old kids declaring their undying love and devotion to each other, just, like, I don't know. It, it wasn't for me. I found it really uncomfortable, in addition to being unbelievable. I gave Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet two stars. Okay, everybody, so those are all of the books I read in July. Quite a mix of ratings there. Uh, please let me know if you guys have read any of the ones I talked about, what you thought of them, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!